So thank you so much, Jackie, for chatting with me on the All Sorts Pod. I have to admit that, like, because I've followed your work for so long and, you know, read so many pieces on you, I feel like I know you a little bit, even though, like, and this always happens with the internet, right? Like, one person feels like they have a little bit more uh, knowledge of the other person. Um, but this is our first time sitting down with each other, chatting and meeting each other. So, yeah, I'm really excited for this conversation. Thanks so much for having me. And I have to say that a lot of people say, oh, I, I feel like I already know you from your Instagram or from the interviews. And I would say, absolutely, you do, because I'm, I feel like I'm pretty transparent and I say what I'm actually thinking in most of the scenarios. So yeah, I would say it's pretty, what you see is what you get out there. Yeah. Which I feel is so refreshing and so welcome these days, that it's not just... It's not just like a, a smattering of insights into who you are, but but choosing to be sort of vulnerable enough and open enough to present like a whole picture of yourself to the world is really nice. Yeah. And obviously I don't want to, like, you know, only my husband gets the really crappy stuff, right? So, or maybe my parents get the really crappy stuff too, <laughs> but you know, we all have bad days and I'm obviously, I'm not going to post that on Instagram and, and subject all <laughs> the public to like my bad days, but you know, in general, yeah, this is, this is, this is what you get when you, when you talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess your wee one is also not old enough to get the worst side of yourself too. Cause I have to admit that I would add my children to that. Like Obviously not all the time, but like every once in a while, they definitely see me at my very not best. Yeah, he's only 14 months yeah. and I've been watching this TV show about how there's this teenage uh, girl and she, her and her mom are not doing so well together. And I was like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen when he becomes a teenager? And he's just like, I hate you. You're the worst mom in the world. Like, how am I going to react? Because this mom didn't react wonderfully but also there's a lot of space for us not to be you know to not do the perfect thing all the time because it's you know they see us for our whole li lifetimes right so it's it's a lot of grace there but gosh I'd like to think yeah I'm on the cusp of it because my oldest is turning 13 and I, you know, probably out of anxiety about those very moments, you know, it's so important to me as a parent that my kids see me as a human first. Like, I want to knock myself off any pedestal they might place me on. Like, I want them to see me making mistakes and in my messiest moments because I want them to know that, like, not only am I so far from perfect, but also that, like, it's okay for them to have those moments, too. Mm hmm. Yeah, I definitely struggle a lot with uh, perfectionism myself. And I think that, you know, Kai, my son has been the greatest teacher in this last year of why not to be a perfectionist. Because I think when you live in the silo of your own thoughts, perfectionism seems like a really great idea. And then, you know, and then he shows up and you realize that the more of a perfectionist I try to be, the more he's going to feel the pressure of being perfect himself. And mm -hmm. I don't want that for him. I want him to feel the full breadth and um, space of just existing and knowing that he's loved exactly as he is. And so for me, it's like, why wouldn't I be giving myself that kind of love and space and healing that inner child, which is a whole other conversation maybe, but, but yeah, it's, it's funny how these little, these little, you know, wise people just challenge our deepest um, crutches. And why is it the hardest to give that grace to ourselves? We're so quick to give it to everyone else. Yeah. And, and, I don't know. I've just been exploring lately about the idea that we've created these um, these mechanisms when we had no adult way to rationalize or even have tools. And so we've created these things as like a two-year-old or a six-year-old or even like a 14-year-old when we 
we don't have the tools and nobody yeah. in that moment maybe gave us the tools. And so we've been operating with that same stuff, with the same one hammer to like nail all the things. And you're like, well, I could, I have like a scalpel now that I could use and, yeah. and other tools, but, um, but to go back and be able to give myself those tools, I think I'm just trying my best. We'll see how, yeah. see what happens. Well, maybe that's a good place to start and to talk, you know, before we get into all of the many incredible things you've done in your life, but to start with you as a child, like what was your family life like growing up? What was that foundation for you? It was really busy in the sense that our house, we, I grew up with um, my sister and my parents, two cousins, two uncles going to university when I was in elementary school, uh, one aunt in college, um, and my grandmother and grandfather all in one house. Amazing. And my parents were the only breadwinners, uh, taking care of everyone, making sure that we all had ski vacations and that my uncles had tuition to go to UBC and, you know, it was a lot. And so I think that I both learned to crave attention and also be quite afraid of it hmm. at the same time. Yeah. So that, that's kind of an interesting dichotomy. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's just so much to unpack when you grow up in such a, a huge family full of energy and everyone's talking over each other and, and debating things. And then, you know, I think I have that also created in me this the dichotomy of being equally extroverted and introverted. Hmm. So not wanting to talk, but always wanting to talk anyway. Yeah. There's that. Well, and maybe just being able to carve out some space for yourself too and all of that activity, right? Yeah, it was it was really difficult because it was a family where we weren't we weren't really well off uh for a lot of our my childhood. And so it was just, you know, the family was struggling to make ends meet sometimes. Um but yeah, and also coming from an immigrant family where practicality is everything. So don't tell me you need something unless it's you're hungry or you're dying. So those were kind of the two things that you were allowed to really like speak up about. Other than that, there just wasn't that much time, which I totally understand if I were taking care of, you know, nine other people, what would, what would I be saying to my family? Right. You know, I can't, I can't even imagine I was raised by a single mom and like, but it was just the two of us. Like, I can't imagine carrying the weight of that household uh, and, you know, everything that goes along with it. And I think, too, you know, as a child, that idea of like, okay, so I can have these things if I truly need it, but maybe I can't like talk about, you know, these like bigger dreams or these bigger wishes. Like, how did that sort of like change what you envisioned for your future or even like what you wanted your later life to look like? Yeah. I mean, I think that I, I sort of get into this a little bit in the first episode of the podcast that I just started, but it was, gosh, this is, this is a, this is an interesting one. It was very hard for me to voice desires and not needs, but at, on, on a practical level, but on another level, I never got attention unless I was doing something extraordinary or very noteworthy. And so I learned that I needed to do attention getting things like being mm. successful at something or um, winning an award at something. Um, and that recognition often gave me the recognition at home. And so I think that I became an ambitious dreamer for myself from a career perspective, uh, but from a personal perspective, um, didn't really know how to ask for very basic things. Like, can you just be there with me quietly while I have this emotion? Things like that became very difficult. 
And in doing that, do you feel like, because one of the things I've noticed in myself is this idea that you have to do it all on your own. You Mm -hmm. have to achieve these things and you have to be totally independent and you can't ask for help. Like, was that something you experienced as well? Yeah, I totally hear you on that. (laughs) Because, you know, when when you do grow up in a space where there isn't a lot of, you know, time or attention, I mean, I often felt like I just needed to manage everything on my own. And so, and even if I did bid for help or attention, there just wasn't that much to give. Like, and it's not because my parents don't love me. I know they love me more than anyone in the whole world. My parents love me. Uh, But they also didn't have the language or the culture that I specifically needed from an emotional perspective. And so I am independent to a fault. And I've actually had to unlearn that um, because it's required when um, this thing called connection with people and, (laughs) you know, it just, yeah, you have to I actually had to force myself to rely on other people. So I made a list of all the things that I could ask other people for help for. Cause I was like, oh yeah, the point of asking for help is not necessarily that you need help. It's that is to create connection with others too. How did you, how do you manage to navigate that for yourself? You know, like, I feel like I'm still failing at that sometimes. (laughs) We all are. I have improved. I, but I, I think that, Exactly what you said was really what sort of hit home for me is how willing I am to help someone who asks for help and how good it makes me feel to have been able to help someone, to be able to support someone. And so trying to flip that, trying to flip that back on myself that if if I can ask someone for support, if I can reach out to someone that they also probably will feel really happy that they were able to do something that supported me. And so in thinking about someone else's response, I think it's made it a little bit easier for me to ask for help. But I mean, here I am working very independently in, you know, a one woman business, (laughs) trying to do all of the things at once. So, you know, any given day, it's 50, 50. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I, I totally hear you. I, I think I got to a point where I was always helping the people around me and I was never allowing them to help me to the point where I think that they felt like there was a wall in terms of how close they could actually get to me. Mm. And that power differential became a barrier to to my relationships deepening. And I was like, wow, this is actually creating the very opposite thing of what I want. Because I think that maybe deep down, I don't want to ask people for help because I either I'm afraid that they won't show up for me and I'll feel rejected or that I'll be a nuisance and they won't love me Mm. as much or, you know, all these sorts of things that I created as a kid. And in fact, the very thing I was trying to avoid, which was rejection and disconnection, was the very thing I was creating from trying to avoid it. And so seeing that, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, like, okay, side story, but this, I feel like this is the point at which I truly started relying on someone Um, I was so independent that my greatest fear was that I would fall off a chair and die and no one would find me for days. Like this was my greatest fear. It wasn't, you know, being slain on the street or I don't know, whatever other big fears other people have. But I was (laughs) like, the fact that like, maybe people on Instagram after a week would notice I'm not posting and be like, Hey, how's it going? Because I never talk to anyone consistently enough that they would ever yeah. wonder. And I was so independent that people would always just assume that I was fine. And so when I expressed this to one of my best friends in Paris, uh, she said, every single day, I'm going to text you in the morning when I wake up, 
yo, are you alive? And I would just, she'd just say, text back an emoji, text back whatever you want, like no pressure, but just text back. And that became the start to me understanding um, that kind of true emotional and practical reliance on someone. Yeah. And that everyday text became, Hey, this is how I'm feeling today or whatever it was. And yeah, so that's, I'm, yeah, it was a real turnaround story for me. That's pretty bad. If like, that's my greatest fear. And I didn't, yeah. Anyway. No, but I think we create these alternate universes of this is how we need to operate. Like this is our operating system based on, I don't want to be a burden or I, I need to be successful or, you know, like I need to do something extraordinary in order to prove my worth. I feel like that's a really big one for me. And we forget that what we crave usually has nothing to do with any of those things, right? Like I am happiest when I'm in deep connection with someone else. I am happiest when I'm outside with the sun streaming down on my face. And none of those things have anything to do with, you know, holding it all together or, you know, taking off a to-do list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although like the A type in me, when I tick off something on the to-do list, it feels so good. It's like I get a little dopamine hit or something. <laughs> But I get you. I get that. Totally. Yeah, it is true. To-do lists are still one of my favorite things. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, like growing up, what did you want to do? Like what did little Jackie envision herself doing? Because you have done so many things already. You're a best-selling author. I read your book and I adored it. You're a pastry chef. You're an entrepreneur. Now you're an advice columnist. Like was any one of those things something that the, you know, 10 year old you envisioned or was it something else entirely? I envisioned something else entirely. I first wanted to be Spider-Man, yes. but then my sister was like, you can't be Spider-Man cause you're a woman anyway. So then I changed and I was like, I want to be a fashion designer. So I wanted to be a fashion designer from the time I was four to like, 16 or something. Um, and then I failed sewing and I was like, oh, I can't be a fashion designer anymore. Anyway, whatever. Uh, no regrets. Um, but I definitely knew that I would always be in some sort of creative field because I am just to my core, um, a creative person. Like I love making things and envisioning things. Um, yeah. So who I am and what I've created today, I think would probably surprise younger me. Um, but yeah, I, I also, because of all, all these realizations about, you know, my worth connected to my career, I've, I've actually gone through quite a lot of, I guess, thinking about it over the last, um, I'd say like five, six years since I sold Boku, um, just untangling what my career means to me mm -hmm. and how much it's fused with my sense of worth and my sense of identity. And so when I think about like, oh, I've accomplished all these things, I think, oh, that's cool. But I don't necessarily think it's made me any more whole of a human being um, other than the fact that I really love creating something and getting it out of my body and into the world. And when that happens, it gives me like that feeling of like, like almost like relief because it feels like this pent up creative energy that I need to get out. But other than that, it, it means um, relatively little to me now mm -hmm. than it did before, I think. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Boku a little bit. How did you end up as a pastry chef opening your own bakery? So I was a designer before I studied fine arts and then I went into graphic design and, um, mostly for advertising stuff and had my own firm for a little while. And I was very depressed. I was waking up every single day wondering, you know, 
what is it that's going to get me through today? How am I going to get myself out of bed this morning? And oftentimes it would be, okay, I'm going to eat a chocolate chip cookie at lunchtime (laughs) because they're so good. And me being a little bit obsessed about things, I started baking chocolate chip. Well, I started looking for the best chocolate chip cookies in town and then baking and then doing like all the recipes and side by side and doing comparisons. And I think that this act of baking moved me out of depression alongside traditional therapy, of course. Um, But I think it helped because you are so in your body when you cook or bake, you have to smell things and hear things and watch to see what color it is when it's coming out of the oven. And, you know, you taste things. And when you're analyzing it, you're using your body in, in such a way that really gets you out of your mind and that kind of like cyclical thinking that sometimes happens in depression. And then one day, so many things, but one day, uh, my former husband and I just thought, well, let's take a sabbatical year off. We'd been saving, uh, to have kids, but, um, he had decided he didn't want kids anymore. So, uh, so I was like, okay, well, all this money, let's, let's put it towards something that people without kids do. Let's take a sabbatical year. And that's when I went to pastry school in Paris and really just opened up as a, as a person and more of that sort of present mind thinking and, um, which is so beautiful about travel is just, you're so present in, in each moment, discovering new things. And then eventually when I got back, I was like, yeah, I want to do this. Even if I go bankrupt, it would have been worth trying. So then that's when I opened Boku. That's how, you know, isn't it? You know, like if you're like, I never, like if it fails horribly, would I still be glad that I did it? Or, you know, people typically say, oh, if you won the lottery and didn't need to work anymore, like, what would you do? And that's what you're supposed to do. But I think being able to go to the worst, like, what is the worst case scenario? Like, I do this and I fall flat on my face, but I'm still glad that at least I try. And like, that's, I think that says so much about like, what the soul is yearning for and like how you have to spend your time. Yeah. And it's a real good litmus test for how bad do you want it when things are going to get tough? Because with any huge thing that you do, it's going to get cumbersome at some point. And there's always going to be something that we don't want to do in the midst of it. But it's a great test to say, no, but I still want it. And I'm willing to make those sacrifices to make it work. And then, because not all things are equal, like not all things... Some things we just really want in our heads, but we don't want in our bodies. And we just go, well, no, no, not worth it. But yeah, this, when you know that you would be willing to fall flat on your face and have your biggest fears realized, and yet they're not so scary because you know that the end result is still worth it. Just the experience of trying it is still worth it. Yeah, that's when you know you got to jump, I think. And what did you learn about yourself in that process? I I have so much respect for people who run like a quote unquote real brick and mortar business, you know, like like Boku, like our mutual friend Zach and the juice truck, because, you know, my my business is essentially like a couple inches of shelf space and like a whole bunch of code. And it's so complex and you are supporting other people's livelihoods. Like, what did you learn about yourself in creating Boku and the And even in the day-to-day running, like when you got past the excitement of launch and like really just had to get into, this is what my days look like. Yeah, I learned that I am very much a creator, but not an operator. And I'm not very good at the day-to-day stuff. And I had to admit that to myself Um, and give those, hand those keys over to other people who are really good at doing that job. So I had people that I relied on, uh, that would do the running 
And by the end of before I handed the bakery over, I feel like it was at its possibly best place that I could have taken it. Um, yeah, but I know me now. I'm not, I don't think I'm a great boss. Like, I just don't think I am. Like, I'm very, like, lofty. And I'm like, what about this cool new idea? And then it's like, the people that are operating it are like, yeah, cool, cool. No. Because, like, that would have taken five months ago for you to, like, you know. So I'm, I'm just, I'm, I don't think I'm a good boss. I realize that. Which is why I don't know if I would ever open a business again that required uh, so many people involved, mm -hmm. like something that I could handle on my own and operate on my own would, would work. But I don't know. I think the people part is always the hardest part when it comes to running a business as almost every single entrepreneur would say the same thing, I think. Yeah, I agree. I, I think some people are just built for that. My husband is an incredible manager. Like he just cares for people so deeply and derives so much joy from helping support them and watching them sort of like fulfill their greatest potential. It blows me away. Whereas I feel like I'm also that lone wolf. I like to have that idea and make that idea happen. And I'll, I'll deal with some of the admin and some of the upkeep and day to day, but managing a bunch of people is probably the thing that I'm most fearful of in terms of like creating a business or maintaining a career. Yeah. I don't know that that's me either. Yeah. It takes a really special person to be able to inspire a team on a daily basis. I think it's really easy to do once and then walk away. Cause <laughs> I mean, we can all say a shiny thing, but yeah, it, and that's part of the reason why I didn't know if I would be a good mom. I really wondered that. I was like, because I, I, I do think that, you know, when you have a business, people are looking to, at you to be a little bit of a role model, to, to really care, like, like your husband does, and nurture. And, and I was like, I don't, I don't know if I'm good at that. And it may, really made me wonder if I was ever going to be good at motherhood because... I don't feel good at those things. And now what about now becoming a mother? How, how does that, that vision or that idea of your role in your son's life changed? I think I'm a better mom than I ever thought I could be. You know, I think that mm, my definition of care, I guess, has changed in that I feel like if I'm just showing up every day, doing the best that I can for myself and for him, and I am willing to be as vulnerable as I can possibly be and just try my best to do right by him, I think that that's as much as I can possibly do to be a mother. So if that's not enough, then I'm really screwed. But like, that's what I'm going to just try. <laughs> I can assure you it's more than an I, you know, I think particularly now we have this expectation that parenthood is so much, right? Like, it's all the perfect parties and the, you know, best activities and making sure they're well-rounded. And, you know, I, I very much embraced like what I call B plus parenting, you know, like same thing. Like <laughs> I love my children with like every fiber and sinew of my being. I love them so much, but I'm not the mom staying up until midnight, you know, like the night before the bank sale. And I, you know, it's just, it's not me. And I also very much hope that that's not what they, not what they need. My goal, my, I feel like my goal is to create well-functioning adults. Like I even, I remember reading something that talked about even how, cause we're like, oh, we, we want our kids to be happy. We need our kids to be happy. And the psychologist was like, it's actually not your 
job to even make your kids happy because in the doing so, we tend to try and shelter them from the messiness of life and the downsides and the challenges and the the times when things don't go their way. But that's, I mean, it's so foundational to who I am. Like all the times I failed, all my fears, all the things that I had to get through, like that's made me what I am. And I wouldn't want to deprive my kids of that experience either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's true. I didn't think I would be so protective of him because as a really independent person, I, you know, my, my motto was, Hey, you do you boo. If you fall, you know, you'll learn something. But with my own kid, I'm like, Oh no, 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 don't, don't, don't uh, you know, and the, my anxiety is like pouring out, you know? And so obviously I fully recognize that my role is to just step myself back from the edge and allow him to explore the world without the filter of my fear. Um, but yeah, I mean, every, even as when we talk about, you know, my growing up and being raised in a, a very busy home with not a lot of space uh, for me to, you know, shine for lack of a better word, that has created some incredibly beautiful things in my life. And I understand that maybe they wouldn't have been ideal, but what is ideal? Like, what is yeah. that? Right? Like we all go through stuff and life is not supposed to be a sequence of ideal things back to back. Like, it's just not the point. Like, we see people who are raised in really ideal situations, and then they, they confront something that's not ideal, and then and then things crumble. But yeah. I think that the crumbling, and the stretching and the, you know, when you work out so hard that like, your muscles ache, and you're being stretched to that point where you feel like you're gonna throw up. I don't know if other people have worked out to this point, but I had a really good trainer once anyway, side <laughs> note. but I feel like those moments are actually, that is the, the meat of life. Like that is maybe why we're here to experience that because something in our soul wants to grow and experience. And so you know, what, what's, what's going to challenge that, the messy stuff. And I think, you know, for, you know, every, every book and every, you know, so many pieces of art and even in our own experience, like it is those moments when you are like laying there curled up, bawling your eyes out in bed or like on the bathroom floor, like those, those true inflection points in your life that I think become such a catalyst for change. I mean, in the moment, I think most of us would be like, I really don't want to deal with this. This is awful. And I don't know where the, for the way forward. But as soon as we move through it, like that, that strength that comes from moving through it, I think helps us build something more beautiful than we would have had before. Oh, absolutely. And also it's this strange way of like, finding out who we actually are. You know, who are we in the midst of all of this? What do I stand for? You know, what am I made of? Like these, because there, there have been moments in my life where I've thought to myself, no, it's not worth it. I, I'd rather just like check out and not do this life thing because it's too hard or whatever it is. And I mean, that might sound really privileged because I'm not like, you know, in a country with a war or like, you know, but pain is very relative. So, but I, I do like this morning I was on a walk and I was doing some like child work where I was kind of like scanning my body for anxiety and I was feeling it in my chest. And so I was just kind of speaking to inner child saying like, I see you, you have space here, you are loved. I'm here to protect you. And the last thing I said was, I'm never going to leave you. Mm. And I think that that was 
this almost like moment of like announcing to myself that no, like no matter what happens, I'm made of the stuff that's not going to give up no matter what. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to leave you. I'll be here till like the bitter end. And I think that makes me feel like emotional, but also like really proud that this yeah. is, this is the kind of person that I am. I will, I'm going to stick it out and I'm going to, I might get knocked down, but I will get back up for me. And that kind of proclamation means a lot. It resonates inside on a deep level, yeah. I think. Yeah. And sometimes that means flying across the globe and yes. setting yourself <laughs> down in Paris and envisioning a new life, which I feel like is like the dreams for at least like, you know, 75% of us on this planet, but you actually did it. You said, okay, I'm going to start again and try something new and sort of like reimagine where my life is going. And where did you get the grit and the bravery to just do that? So I, I hate to disappoint a little bit, but it, I don't think it was as monumentous as, as that because I had lived there during pastry school, um, you know, for a short period of time, it was like four months or something. I, I already had it in my mind of what life looked like living there. And then after I opened the bakery, I also started a pastry tour company in Paris so that I could spend more time in Paris. And then I also started working as a travel writer. Um, and so I was traveling a lot. Um, and then I just found myself in Paris more and more and more each year. So weeks turned into months. And then eventually, uh, I just thought, well, I've been looking to invest in a home. I don't know if I wanted to invest in Vancouver, um, because I didn't know how much time I was going to spend here. Mm -hmm. And my friend, uh, the very friend that called me on the phone in the, in the morning, she was in Paris at the time. And she just said, well, why don't you just start looking for a place? If you find a place, great, but stop looking in Italy and in like New Mexico and all these places that you've only been to once, like you keep on coming back to Paris. So look here. So I did, and I found a place and I thought, wow, there's a lot of potential here. And then I thought, well, if I just, maybe I'll lowball them. And if I get it, it's just meant to be. And then I got it. So it Amazing. happened in this very like natural rolling sort of way where all of a sudden I didn't know I was living in Paris, but then I was living in Paris. And I wasn't even planning on being there all the time, but I think my body just knew that I needed to land somewhere after years of being on the go, not in one place for more than like a week. There were moments in, in those years when I had two suitcases packed so like I could land and pick up another suitcase and leave again. And so I think my body was like, just sit for a little bit and be still. So I, unconsciously created this haven for myself and this home that just felt so inspiring, but also nourishing. And then when I finally sat down, I couldn't move for years. Like I literally sat at home for years and people would be like, you're in Paris. What kind of fun things are you doing now? I'm like, <laughs> I'm at home like all the time. So yeah. That's what happened. That's how I, that was the grand picture of how I moved to, to Paris. But I think that's also pretty incredible because I, I'm very much one of those people who believes like when you're on the right path, the universe does sort of conspire to like get you there. So the fact that you're like, oh, all of a sudden, I guess I live here now. I mean, it was just meant you were meant to be there. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely was. It was, you know, it was a period in time where things could be very quiet for me. I think if I were back in Vancouver, there's always so many friends and so many parties to go to and so much media stuff to attend that I think being in a place where nobody really cares who you are because they don't know who you are. And even if they did, they really wouldn't care because Parisians are really cool. So yeah, it was the perfect environment for me to hide and recover, I think. 
And I think having those moments too, of just being able to sort of like go back inside and sit, like honestly, like marinate in everything. Right. And I, I wonder, you know, how much of, of these experiences and these opportunities sort of like led you to this path of giving advice, which I think is so amazing. So where did the whole advice columnist thing come from? Okay. (laughs) I just think this is so funny that I'm like an advice columnist. Okay. So I, like 10 years ago, around the start of Boku, I actually was like, what do I want to do next? And I I thought to myself, I want to be an advice columnist because ultimately I want to be Fraser Crane. Yes. And <laughs> yeah, because Fraser Crane is like just so cool. Anyway, aside from just getting the tweed jacket, I actually approached um, like a, a newspaper about it. And they said, we love this idea, but you can't be an anonymous advice giver because if you don't have the credentials, like some doctor or whatever, you can't just be anonymous. That's not going to work. You have to show up as you. Mm -hmm. And I was too nervous to give advice as who I was. And so I declined doing it back then. I'd been thinking about doing it for ages. And I think that when, after I wrote my memoir, which has a letter in it, that is a little bit, a letter to myself, a little bit, a letter to a friend who, who was going through something at the time and a letter to pretty much everyone who's ever wondered where am I going and who am I? Um, that felt like the closest form to an advice column that I had ever written and it felt, and it was the only chapter in the book that was never edited. It just stayed exactly the same. Hmm. And it wasn't even planned for this chapter. It was just spontaneous. I wrote it and it stayed in there. And years later during the pandemic, it was um, Vitruvi who had a new magazine out, asked me what I wanted to write because they, they wanted me to write something. And I said, you know, I'm just not into writing lists or this and that. I just want to write something that I feel like really passionate about. And then the editor was like, you should do an advice column. I'm like, oh my God, perfect. Someone else believes in me. That must mean I should do it. So then we did that for a year. It was one of my absolute favorite things to do. Like, I don't necessarily think I have all the answers. Obviously I do not. But what I loved is that people were brave enough to come forth with their most vulnerable questions. Like these questions are like, should I stay or should I go? Should I leave this relationship that I've been in when I have this desire in me to like go out and explore the world, knowing that something's not done yet, it's not finished. And, or like, you know, is there really a light at the end of the tunnel? And I loved that these questions would make me reflect on my own life and think, when have I felt the same thing before? And the other thing that it did was it, it's just so much more apparent every single time someone asks a question that we are all struggling through the exact same stuff, that we're all going through some heartbreak, some disappointment, some moment of will this fall break me or I know I have something inside me that I need to give, but I don't know what it is yet, or I don't know how to get it out there. Like everybody's going through the same stuff and yet we're not talking about it. And what I love is that, okay, so that's kind of why I wanted to do this podcast is like, let's give ourselves a space, not just experts, but me and you or I guess the name of the podcast is you You and I, so I should have said (laughs) you and I. (laughs) Like the neighbor, the person standing next to you in the grocery grocery lineup, the person that you're sitting next to on an airplane, 
we all have so much wisdom. And if we don't, if we haven't come out with any lessons that we've learned, we have empathy to give and compassion and the simple words that you are not alone. So that is the whole purpose of the podcast. I'm so jazzed about it, as you may tell just from my like yeah. energy level just now. I'm like, yeah, but yeah, I, I love this so much. It's yeah. And I've given myself like a year to see how it goes and if it goes nowhere, it goes nowhere. And it would have been equally as rewarding for me just to mm. do from a personal growth standpoint. And hopefully someone out there says, I didn't feel so alone in this thing I was struggling through. And that would be absolutely enough for me to think that this is worth, worth doing, giving it a go, I guess. And again, that through line of just connecting, right? The idea, if I can see myself in your struggles, or if I can benefit from the wisdom of your experience that I think particularly now when, you know, superficially we appear to be so much more connected than we ever have been, but it's so much easier to feel also so isolated and alone. And we have this bizarre ability to think I'm the only one who feels this way, or I'm the only one struggling like this. And so it becomes a point of shame or we have guilt around these thoughts or feelings and to have that vulnerability to really connect at that level, say, I am struggling with this and for people to see themselves in that connection and in that conversation is such an incredible thing. Yeah, it is. And it's also, I think, a really dangerous place to think that you're alone. Because I remember being in, in the hardest parts of my depression, feeling quite ashamed that I was feeling the things I was feeling, you know, feeling ashamed of myself, but on top of that, feeling ashamed that I was feeling ashamed of myself. And, you know, it's just like this endless cycle of, of, false reasons to stay hidden and quiet. And I think people shrivel. And some people, unfortunately, you know, they don't make it or they can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Because I do believe that our community and the, the love that comes from our community is the light. And so the more we share, the more we open up, the more we allow ourselves to, again, rely on others to maybe not have them fix things, but to know that we have a safe space to just express ourselves. And maybe that's it. Like that is the light that gets us through, I think. So yeah, it's just so crucial to to talk about this stuff, I think, in, in a safe environment. Yeah, I... I agree. And I'm just, I applaud you for, for opening up this conversation and creating this space where people can feel that vulnerability and share that vulnerability in a really open and honest way. Yeah. I'm, I'm, we're already getting some amazing questions and yeah, I just, I know there's, I know there's more too. I can feel people are a bit hesitant to write in questions right now, just cause it's so new but I can just feel questions bubbling and I'm sure that there's someone out there that has a question that they, that they just want. Yeah. They just want to, to share, or have answered. And if there's anyone listening, please do submit your questions. Cause this is the part that like, just, yeah, it, it does light me up to know that we're sharing our questions. Yeah. And I'll make sure that there's a link for folks so they can. So I feel like it's always, you know, even at the end, I do talks and at the end, you know, there's always that hesitation when you ask for questions and then the first question happens and the second question, and then all of a sudden, like seven people, you know, as soon as you, as soon as that sort of like barrier has been breached, like the sort of like tidal wave just like crashes over. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. I can, I can feel it happening and the questions we've already gotten are, are so thought provoking and I've been having, I've been doing one of the questions today. And it's just, yeah, my mind is consumed by it, which I don't know, personally, I love that feeling. So yeah. Beautiful. 
I feel like this is the perfect time to switch into our rapid fire questions. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so first one, real, real simple, nice little softball. Uh, what is your favorite thing to do with your son right now? Okay. He has this thing where one of us carries him and the other person chases him and he starts screaming at the top of his lungs because he's like, like a good scared, like he's laughing and giggling and, and screaming, but we just go around in circles and then sometimes I'll hide behind like a corner and then jump out and scare. Anyway, he's, <laughs> he loves that. I love it even more. Oh I love the shriek. The joyous yes. shriek. <laughs> so good. Okay. Uh, the dinners you sit down to when you really don't feel like cooking. Oh, like what do I eat? Mm -hmm. Well, we order a lot of food when I don't cook. And I'm going to admit that I don't cook a lot, um, which I think a lot of people are horrified to hear, but um, just, you know, accept it. I don't cook a lot. My mother-in-law cooks a lot for us. And Amazing. so does my mom. We're very lucky. And then when we, when we don't get um, home delivered, home cooked meals, uh, we do order out. I have been craving Minerva's lasagna all week. I don't know if you know of this place. It's a place in like Carisdale. I think it's supposedly Ryan Reynolds, like his favorite restaurant, oh, yeah. I think, because he grew up around here. But they have this lasagna and it's just ooey gooey. It's not fancy. It's slutty the way that like you want like cheesy lasagna to be. And it's just delicious. Anyway, yeah, it's very That very was good going to be my question was it is this a fancy lasagna or is it one of those super gooey ones that like comes in like the tin foil yeah. Yeah. yeah it comes in the tin foil thing and if meatballs are your thing there they you can also get huge meatballs in your lasagna so that's a, an option as well but it is like the cheese is like not fancy cheese. It does not have some sort of designation from its like <laughs> originating, originating country or whatever. It is like shredded cheese from a bag probably. And it's yeah. like good for the soul, this thing. It just is. <laughs> I remember that kind of lasagna. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, one thing about Paris or from Paris that you wish you had access to here in Vancouver. Ooh, that one's a tough one. Uh, I would say really good cafes that not the kind of cafes we have in Vancouver where they're like community spaces, workspaces for sure, but the kind that like sprawl out into the street and it doesn't close until like 4 a.m. And like the drinks aren't good, but you're there because it's just energy from other people yeah. and people watching like I miss I miss that kind of environment and how how plentiful it was that you could just go to any street corner and there would be some cafe with someone you know gossiping about someone else yeah I mean it's just like a really cool environment yeah I always love that you just get whatever like basic house wine or even just like a coca-cola and then they just leave you there for hours yes like they put the bill there mm -hmm. not because you should go but just because they don't know when you're gonna leave it could be like 10 hours from that point they're yeah. like here's your bill again yeah so yeah oh i miss i miss those lazy days and like conversations that would happen when you're sitting side by side yeah. and facing out onto the street, those kinds of conversations. Yeah. Very cool. And they're unique. And I always, you know, <laughs> taking it back to the parenting thing, you know, I've, I've heard so many times from, you know, whichever expert that some of the best times to have conversations with your kids is when you're in the car and not looking at each other because it sort of lowers the barrier to entry. And I think that's sitting side by side does too like mm -hmm. we're not super committed we're just taking in the scene but then you somehow have this like deep and nourishing conversation you're like what the heck just happened yeah yeah it's so true 
Yeah. And then if people are uncomfortable with the, <laughs> with the level of depth, they can just go, Oh, look at that dog walking by <laughs> with that funny hat, you know, and then just break it and then slowly yeah. get so it's just an ease it's so easy yeah yeah easy easy like rosé with ice cubes in it and like easy conversation yeah perfection okay mm -hmm. uh something you've read or watched lately that you love okay tiny beautiful things oh. on disney okay it is based on cheryl strade's advice column but it is the story of the alternate Cheryl Strayed. Like, what if Cheryl Strayed had not gone on that wild mm. hike? Who would she have become and what would she have done? And in the midst of, like, answering the questions that came in through her column, I have been in tears by the end of every single episode. Okay. Yeah, it is so good. On the list. Anyway. Okay. I'm definitely gonna have to watch that now. And okay. And then the last one and the biggie, what is giving you joy right now? I would say, obviously the podcast really genuinely is, uh, that wasn't just a shameless plug. Like it really is giving me a lot of like energy and excitement. Um, but in terms of joy, pure joy, of course, my baby, yeah. like he, it's just such a it's just a, an easy, low hanging fruit kind of joy. Cause he's just joy, like in a tiny little body that's like squishy and wobbly. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's so cute. Like when he looks at you and you know, you're connecting with your, with your eyes and you give him a big smile, he just, you know, he feels the love immediately. Like it's so just so on the surface, everything I, yeah, he's like my little joy. So, God, they're just the cuddles. Like, are such a yeah. wellspring of life affirmingness. Like, it's, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah it's very true. When he actually hugs me back, wow, that's like everything. Yeah. Jackie, thank you so much for taking this time to, to share your wisdom with us. I'm so excited for everyone to experience you and I. Thank you so much for inviting me and for just inviting me into this conversation. It's been really cool. Thank you.